Welcome to a special extended presentation. Take a seat, grab some drinks, and most importantly, be sure to commit. I wish I could say the title of this video was an exaggeration, but unfortunately, it's the truth. For the past few days, the only piece of media I have been consuming is that of analog horror. If you know me, you know that I get incredibly unnerved by this type of horror. I don't know why, it just hits a certain spot of the brain I haven't had access to yet. However, this is the third video I've made on the subject, so if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out the other two afterwards. Being that it's been three, my fear of analog horror is slowly getting conquered. No longer do I have to look away from the screen or pull one side of my headphones off my ears. Granted, I didn't completely stop, but the amount of times I did lessened. This journey has been one of the most interesting deep dives I have ever had the pleasure of going on. The creativity of some of these videos are through the roof, and it constantly had me questioning what they could do next. Each entry here truly felt vastly different from the last, making it a whole new experience each time. Just like last time, all of these entries were recommended by you guys, so without further ado, let's get right into it. This one's a long one, so strap in, grab a drink and some snacks, and get comfy, because this shit is about to get dark real fast. Before I let you get too far, if you enjoy your stay, be sure to hit all those buttons down below. And if you want to support us outside of YouTube, I'll have the letterbox and Instagram link down below. Alright, now you can return. First, we have The Walton Files. The Walton Files is a series created by Martin Walls, and we follow the story through a series of VHS tapes played throughout. The first tape that is played in the first episode has us watching a technical support slash maintenance training video for a family-friendly restaurant called Bond's Burgers, owned by Bunny Smiles Incorporated. You have applied to a job in technical support and maintenance. What does this job particularly mean? It immediately seems like our job heavily involves the frightening animatronics that perform for us in the next scene. Oh look, they're playing my favorite song as a kid. And on that farm he had some pigs. <laughs> The showstoppers consist of Bon, Shaw, Boozoo, and Banny. The role we are given is labeled Facility Caretaker, and like predicted, a part of our job description is robot maintenance, so we're probably screwed. We are introduced to Jack Walton and Felix Kranken, who are the founders of Bunny Smiles. We are then immediately shown an image describing a storage facility for the corporation. Under the name K9, the facility was a company project to storage all valuable items from the closed for good Bon's Burgers restaurant. Read a little further and there was a supposed incident inside the 74 Bonds Burgers locations which led to the closure. This resulted in all props, animatronics, and even arcade machines to be permanently sealed in the facility that is in the middle of the forest. I don't know who in their right mind would want to work all the way out here. Before we see any more, we cut to a grey looking bunny that is clearly speaking in reverse. We finally start to remember, back all day, they will be back for you soon, Sophie. Right now, all this sounds like nonsense. But before we have any time to process, we cut to the second tape. This tape shows what looks like an episode of kids TV, but with the Bonds Burgers characters. We follow Bon, who is throwing a sleepover with all of his friends, and is going to have a movie night. On the invite list, we have Shaw, Boozoo, and Billy. Billy hasn't been shown before, and I immediately do not like him. The invite list is repeated, but Billy is replaced with someone who looks like Jack Walton. Shaw, Boozoo, and... All the friends show up in the movie Bond Picks has another distorted image of Jack. When we take a look at the TV, we are just met with text that says let me out of here. After the movie, everyone goes to sleep, however a noise in the house wakes up Bond and has them walking throughout the house to see what the noise is. It appears that the noise is the TV playing whatever Jack movie was on. This shows us that Jack is missing, which keeps adding to my list of questions. Bond picks up a lighter and starts trying to light it, however once successful we switch to what looks like a female employee of the name Sophie, and behind her stands a giant Bond animatronic. Anyone else's keen eyes would have seen there was a pill bottle by the TV that had Sophie Walton written on it. Walton? You mean this dude? We quickly cut to one of the employees named Brian Stells in our now third tape. Brian is a new facility caretaker and is heading towards K9. His reason for filming is due to the company wanting archives. Brian continues looking for the facility, but since it's in the middle of the forest, he's having a hard time. Once he finds it though, he is walking around inside and we see him looking at many of the company photos along the wall. He finds the Bon animatronic and it looks oddly massive and 100% villainous. Our poor maintenance worker is doing checks on the animatronic, but suddenly it starts to move on its own and attacks him. 
Brian runs through the forest trying to escape, but unfortunately a blood-covered Bond catches up and kills him. At least I assumed this was poor Brian. Before cutting to black, text appears that says I can't feel anything. He thought I was her. Brian's ID slowly comes into frame before shining on a picture of Jack Walton, which is a man I would never want to see in real life. That's the end of the first episode, and god damn it, did I have many questions. What was the 74 incident? Why is the Bond animatronic out for blood? Why is the canine storage facility in the middle of nowhere? I need answers. Our next episode starts us off on another Bunny Smiles Incorporated tape where the year at the bottom is oddly blacked out. The tape we are watching is going over the relocate project, which was proposed by Felix, but oddly no mention of Jack. During a horrible four years of legal trouble, the brand was focusing mostly on merchandise and TV shows and even games. However, it got to the point where Felix was ready to boot those animatronics back up and try again in a new Bond's Burgers location. There is no opening date yet, but he promises it will be soon. As the tape comes to an end, we see Felix, but once the narrator goes to talk about Felix's giant heart, we smash cut to a creepy looking Jack Walton, and then an even worse image of Jack hiding in the darkness. After that nightmare, we go on to watch the next tape, which is going over all the facial expressions the animatronics are capable of, and also some new features that are exclusive to the new restaurant. The animatronic we are focusing on is Banny, as we jump through expressions and a new feature that allows the animatronics to blink. It also has the eyes move around, as it states she is looking for customers. I'd hate that. Not long after, the animatronic and someone else's face start overlapping. We now look as if we are viewing things from what looks like a top-down arcade game as it appears Banny is running around trying to get out of the building while a voice repeats that the rabbit needs to get out, before switching to the rabbit is starving. The mighty rabbit needs to get out. The rabbit is starving. The rabbit is starving. Honestly, this is going to get hard to explain, so I will just show you what happens. That's a lot to attempt to unpack. Hiding in the Dark is another missing poster, except this time for Susan Woodings. My guess is, pretty much like Five Nights at Freddy's, there are people being stuffed into these animatronics. Except, who would be doing this? My suspicions of this started when it flashed human-like eyes inside of the Bond suit when it was attacking Brian. But all we can do is watch more to find out. The next tape is another technical support video giving us a tour and orientation for the K9 facility. It is incredibly important to have your BSI ID card and your uniform. We are shown a nice backpack of all the things we will need for our job, including lanterns, snacks, a key, a camera, and also Jack needs to be with you too. Wow, it's pretty dark here. You should turn on the light. Turn on the light. Turn on the light. Turn on the- We cut to black and are instructed to turn on the light, except the tape seems to cut out because she repeats the line over and over again. Shaw tells us about the first room that needs to be kept clean and such, and then takes us into the main hall that has three doors. Door 1 is cleaning items, door 2 is merch and stuff, the third door is used to hide and door 3 hides something we don't get to hear, probably bodies. Shaw takes us then to the basement before she starts talking in reverse. Rosemary would go to the restaurant every night hoping that his beloved husband would reappear after being missing for weeks, but no response until one day she heard a voice saying, I know where she is Rosie, coming from the backstage. The only male we know is missing currently is Jack, so it wouldn't be too far off, I'd say, to think Rosemary and Jack are married. Plus, you know, we get a lot more frightening flashes and glitches before seeing the Shaw animatronic flash in and out of frame, being replaced with an actual lady who we learn is Rosemary. The story continues and we learn that when Rosemary goes backstage, she is met with Bond instead of her husband, before having all of her limbs cut off and then restuffed in the animatronic. This just keeps getting more and more wild. We flash to another missing poster, except this time for Rosemary. This leads me to assume that Susan is inside Banny, and perhaps Jack is inside Bon, but I'm pretty sure we know for a fact Rosemary is inside Shaw at this point. The next tape follows three technicians who are staying three days in the storage facility to reprogram the animatronics to aid the relocate project. Our techs are Hillary, Ashley, and Kevin, and we are shown the next bit of the story through their eyes. Hillary talks about how Bond's Burgers wasn't open for very long, and that people were complaining about music coming from the building at around 1 or 2 in the morning. After people reported a woman's scream inside the restaurant, the location was closed. That semi-solves our mystery as to why the 1974 location got shut down. 
We carry on inside where we see them going over some plans on the reprogramming. In the night, Ashley gets super curious as to why they are given a small key, yet with no known reason for its use. Yeah, the company gives us this tiny key, but never mentioned its purpose. You're just overlooking. At the end of the three days, Kevin and Hillary explain that the robots were so badly damaged that they could barely get any work done on them. During the last night there, Ashley takes the camera and wanders on her own to find out where the key leads. She runs into a door labeled back doors and wouldn't you know it, the key works. She says she's just going to take a quick peek since the area seems to be small. Little does she know the place wasn't small and is actually a room full with a bunch of doors. She doesn't have time to go through all of them so her new plan involves opening a bunch of random ones quickly and filming the inside. Multiple rooms are said to be empty and contain nothing interesting until Ashley comes up on a door that was left open. Inside this room, we learn there was a bunch of spare endo parts and what looks to be unused animatronics hanging up and also under a tarp. The next room we see has some spare heads, but nothing too exciting overall. However, we see a familiar looking animatronic of that gray bunny we saw earlier with the cryptic reverse message about Sophie. The next animatronic she runs into is Billy, that awful clown one. Yet in his chest, it looks like a tape player, which Ashley finds the corresponding tape for. All we hear on the tape is a distorted version of Happy Birthday alongside creepy laughter before Ashley gets killed and presumably stuffed inside Billy. The third episode is where things start to make a bit more sense as to what has been happening. It appears that we are watching captured footage from this arcade game that Sophie and a new character Jenny are playing together. Well, more like Jenny is showing Sophie the game. The game begins with a story cutscene as we learn the plot of the game. Basically, there is a fruit festival going on, and everyone forgot to bring the fruit. Right off the bat, Bond seems to be kind of an asshole since he doesn't want to hear anything from Banny and goes off on the group for forgetting the fruits. No, ask me! Please, I know! Ask me! Anyone else aside from Banny? You guys want fruits, right? Uh, no. Well, you dumb little I mean, I get it. Banny is borderline screaming, and forgetting fruit for the fruit festival is ridiculous, but no need to be so rude. Sophie is quick to mention that the artwork in the game seems very familiar to her. Jenny chalks it down to the company being in the news recently due to Brian being missing. I mean, that company has been pretty relevant these past few weeks. Didn't you hear? What? What happened? She also goes on to mention an urban legend about an employee named Ashley who died in some bunker. We know what truly happened to these poor souls. Jenny ends up leaving as Sophie continues to play by herself. The game ends up glitching out to an extreme degree and Sophie leaves in fear because look at this crap, I'd run too. She returns the next day and explains the glitches to Jenny, but she isn't there for too long and Sophie's back to playing by herself. Throughout the episode, she begins to remember more and more and she starts to get the idea that the game is trying to send her messages through the glitches. While this may seem like a ridiculous theory, there's an unlisted video within the Walton Files playlist called Lucky You that describes that these animatronic slash human hybrids are attempting to communicate through analog somehow. This would explain at least why they would be able to communicate with Sophie directly in this way. As she plays, she says that the pills she takes have been making her forget things from her teenage and childhood years, hence a lot of things being a blur for her since we know there's a direct connection with her and Bond's burgers her being Jack's daughter after all. We begin to flash to a bunch of letters from Felix's now ex-lover from when they were together, going from the time she moved in to the slow development of Felix's increasing alcoholism, getting so bad that she ends up leaving him. Once this episode gets closer to its conclusion, Sophie begins to remember the direct link she has with this brand and her past. We even see moments where it looks like Sophie is communicating back and forth directly with whatever is causing this. We flash to a phone call of Jack asking Felix if he can take his two youngest kids to a school dance and then take them home after it's done. They have a school event tonight. A school party and they have no one to pick them up. See, Jack's kids not only consisted of just Sophie, but also Ed and Molly. Felix hesitantly agrees and takes them. After a bit, we begin to see how this whole thing plays out. We see Ed and Molly get ready for the dance before it looks like Sophie is playing out the events in the game. Once the event comes to a close, Ed and Molly find Felix in, who would have thought, the drinking zone. Even the kids know that this is a horrible decision. Felix gets them all up in the car anyways, and I gotta say this whole segment was not very fun to watch and hear, but Felix's piss poor decision making leads to a car crash that kills both Ed and Molly. He takes their bodies off into a familiar deep forest and buries the bodies and then just doesn't tell anybody. Not even Jack, who calls very obviously worried. 
However, what we see here leads me to believe that Ed and Molly are somehow inside or are possessing the Grey Bunny animatronic, which we now know is named Rocket. So from what I can piece together in timeline order is that back in around the 60s, Jack Walton and Felix Kranken got together and created the idea of Bond's Burgers. Before the restaurant even opens, Felix falls into heavy alcoholism, which results in his significant other leaving him, and that very same day, he gets into a drunk driving accident with Jack's two youngest kids in the car, killing them. Jack ends up missing, and Felix opens the restaurant. That's pretty much where the story concludes as of right now. I hear there are more episodes to come, but unfortunately I don't have all the answers. I really enjoyed what I watched, however, with the Walton Files. I will say pretty quickly that I had a fear that it was going to be a carbon copy of Five Nights at Freddy's, but it soon veered into a direction that was more fresh and a bit unexpected. It had me on the edge of my seat a bunch of times throughout, and I'm very excited to see the future installments. Our second entry in the list is Vita Carnus. Vita Carnus is created by Darian Quilloy, and takes place in a world where in 1931, a new life form was discovered called Vita Carnus, which translates to living meat. Great. For the first eight episodes, we learn about each type of species of Vita Carnus that exists in the world, and we get a nice overview of how they operate. The first tape goes on to describe to us the crawl species. The crawl grows in similar fashion to the small intestines, and is able to get its energy through the basics, water and sunlight and so forth. It's spread all over the globe due to its ability to survive anywhere, and it even greatly benefits the natural order. We learn next about these little guys called trimmings. Trimmings are born from the crawl and over time get bigger as they eat. Their preferred food source is dead meat and plants and are basically the equivalent to our raccoons. These little guys are even domesticated in some homes, considering they are a good way to get rid of all of your gross garbage. So far, I'm having a hard time finding anything wrong with this new species. It only seems to have positives, other than the fact that the sight of one makes me want to throw up, but, you know, maybe we can look past it. Our next creature is called the Meat Snake. This is when I first started to have my doubts on if I could live in harmony with the Vita Carnas, considering snakes are the worst. Their average full size is 5 meters, which is already too big. Yet the largest one that has been reported was up to 40 meters. These guys are basically just giant snakes, except they have a pretty cool ability to absorb the skulls of dead animals and use it as its own head armor. Every time it gets food, it continues to get bigger, so I can only imagine how much that one ate to get to 40 meters. We also learn in a not-so-fun visual that they are able to split apart and reproduce on their own. Still, however, you have to admit there has yet to be any true downsides to having these guys around. Oh wait, let's get into what this mimic is all about. I have been waiting for this to take a turn, and here it is. The mimic is the closest looking to humans, and funny enough, this thing strictly eats humans. So much so that they learn people's routines so they know when it is best to break into the person's home and eat them. We get to see a very, honestly impressive, visual of that happening to somebody. It was super scary, but you gotta admit those prosthetics are awesome. The best fact of all is that if they eat enough people, they gain the ability to grow skin and look more and more identical to that of another human. Eat too many humans and they could become something much worse, but we have yet to see what the Elder Mimics are capable of. Unsurprisingly, however, these Mimics are an active problem with many people going missing, and many of them being due to these Mimics. From here on out, these creatures become more and more of an issue. Next up, we have the Harvester. The Harvester plants itself in a spot, and the tendrils run through underground in the surrounding area. It acts as sort of a bear trap, where if you step in the wrong spot, the tendril will bite you and inject you with venom that has a 100% death rate. There is no cure, and you just have to accept defeat if you get caught by this. For the most part, harvesters only eat larger animals. Great. And leave smaller ones alone, as they aren't worth the time nor energy. Once grabbed, it'll also yank whatever it's got around, and all the damage makes this one a pretty formidable threat. After our friend the harvester, we move on to the host of influence. This one is exclusive to North America, and plants itself in one spot and doesn't seem to plan on moving. It can, but it just doesn't want to. The host of influence can spray out a spore that carries out into the wind and attacks a person's brain. Once ingested, the person that's been infected will get the sudden urge to walk all the way to where the host of influence rests and sacrifice himself to the creature. If ingested, you have about 36 hours until it wears off, so unless you have friends to pin you down, you're pretty screwed. In 1972, the monolith was introduced, forming a huge seven-man circle. These things are 120 meters in height. The giant legs they have go all the way underground, so these big guys ain't moving. As of right now, they don't really do anything except stand in a circle. The notes shown on screen say that the head is able to make incredibly loud noises, and in one instance, an EMP blast. 
We learn of one instance where the monoliths got aggressive, but the reasons why are bleeped out. All we know is the military got involved, and the monolith was able to use its incredibly long arms to immediately disable the threats to it. Rockets ended up being fired at the creature, yet over a quick time, they just regenerated. The next creature is exclusive to the full version of the documentary, Singularity. Not much is known about Singularity, as it is incredibly classified. What we do know is that it's around 1 meter in diameter and is able to emit magnetic fields and wave patterns, and also that it is being held in a classified location. Hmm. Well, that concludes the documentary portion of Vita Carnis, but the series continues onwards. We get a cooking recipe that includes crawl. It doesn't look very appetizing, however it gets topped off with a seasoning called Flavor Enhancer, which you know this stuff is off because once mentioned, the music gets increasingly aggressive. At this point, finish preparing the dish with your flavor enhancer, but allow your dish to cool to a temperature below 60 degrees Celsius. We can put that thought away for now and carry on. The next piece we see is a guide for taking care of trimmings. Nothing stands too much in this entry except for the fact that trimmings really enjoy listening to the radio. Why? This manages to explain a little bit about the wave patterns the singularity is capable of emitting, and why sometimes the crawl seems to grow over satellite dishes and it becomes a bit of a problem for people. We get a bit more background information on that frightening 40 meter long meat snake. It was discovered underground in 1945 and got to that size due to the mass amounts of dead bodies that I'm presuming were dumped into the tunnels following the end of World War II. Because of how many humans this one ate has also resulted in darker skin which showed to be much stronger than the skin of most of the creatures. They even went so far as to say it smelled good. Following this entry, we head to Mimic Defense Instructional Tape, which was one I had been dreading to get to. We learned that in 1986, there was an uptick in Mimic's killing people. Granted, they are able to put on clothes as an attempt to disguise, and can confold themselves to fit into really small hiding spots, which I hate looking at these. We end up following two characters, Chris and Janice, who appear to be heading towards a trailer in the middle of the night, which we all know is a horrible idea. However, they don't listen to horror rules, and Chris ends up vanishing in almost a fraction of a second, and Janice just thinks it's Chris being a jokester. She doesn't take too kindly to it, however, as she goes to just return home. Unfortunately, on her way back, she runs into a mimic which chases her all the way home and very easily breaks in through the door and kills her. Yikes. Carrying on to Species Anomaly Report, we learn that for some reason, the harvesters are starting to migrate upwards in big groups. Not too much goes on this episode, except we get to hear a pretty violent depiction of a child getting ripped apart by a harvester. Not too long after, the mother suffers a similar fate. I found that things started to uncover themselves a bit more in the next entry, which is a commercial for that flavor enhancer, except this time it's the deluxe version, which just means bigger size it looks like. From what I can gather, its main selling point is that it just makes food taste better, and you'd think it's crack after seeing how much these people put on their food. Except I gotta say, the more I watch this, the more I'm reminded of those spores the host would shoot out. I mean, the temperature control is the same, it looks the same, and with how crazy it makes people, you'd think it's downright mind control. Which, it is. In the episode following this one, we find out that the company behind Flavor Enhancer is now under fire due to a lot of people getting sick off of it. I imagine you'd get sick off of anything if you put half the amount you've been dumping off Flavor Enhancer. We then transition to a message from someone unknown to a group called Carcass, which had previously tried to investigate the company behind Flavor Enhancer, and it didn't end very well. The person sending the message seems to be trying to expose a hidden conspiracy going on. He points out that no one is dealing with a harvester that has been the cause of multiple deaths. However, all of these deaths are getting covered up by someone. I wonder why they would cover up the deaths caused by these creatures. The latest entry of the series has us following a mission into Facility Zero. This facility is located within the circle the monoliths gather around. The zone in between has become restricted and not many people know what's happening in there. There's even a harvester that's acting as a guard. These people must have found great use of the creatures if they are going through this much length to cover up many things pointing towards them being more of a threat. We continue as the operation carries on inside the facility, and what we find next is quite shocking. In a quick flash, we see what looks like a bunch of people bowing down before a ring of singularities. Turns out there are seven singularities all being held within this facility. Not long after, however, it sounds like the group infiltrating mowed them all down before the season comes to a close. Since there is still a new season yet to come, I only have my current theories as to where it's going. My guess is that the Vita Carnus have been giving false information in the beginning documentaries. There is some conflicting information. For example, in the beginning it says you can't kill the Mimic, so you shouldn't even try. If you have a weapon, do not use it. 
a mimic is fairly resilient, and any strikes or shots on a mimic is not effective enough to bring it down in time. Yet in the later guide of survival, it states that shooting it in the head could work. I'm not too sure, but their connections to technology has me suspicious of what it is we are actually being told. There also seems to be a big cult-like group that worships these singularities, or are being controlled by the Vita Carnis. Who knows until the next season, which I will definitely be tuning in for. If I'm being completely honest, this latest entry is probably my favorite out of the three, and that one was the highly requested Monument Mythos. I had no idea what I was getting into with this series, but it certainly wasn't what I got. I just want to be clear right up front and say that I have only watched the first season for this series, but trust me I will be catching myself up. But let's get into our third and final series. We start off in 2011, where Riley Tillen uploaded three videos describing an unseen presence in his home. Up front, we learn that the fourth video raised safety concerns and started an investigation. The first upload is narrated by Riley, explaining the idea of dimensional travel. I'm not really going to be able to explain it very well, but if you've seen Adventure Time, it appears that dimensional travel works similarly to the gateway to hell. Except the corners are just intersecting points between dimensions that only these corner folk are able to pass through, only to be seen for a brief second before vanishing into what Riley refers to as the corner world. We learn that while Riley is away, the corner folk don't just zip on by, but instead take time to chill for a bit. At first I thought they looked like frogs, but now they look like big spiders and I'm no longer a fan. Riley has become so consumed by the corner world that he is even dreaming in the world. He is also starting to perceive time differently too, stating he was fired for repeated absences, yet to him it felt like he left work this afternoon. We finally got to the upload that raised concerns, and rightfully so. Riley takes a leap towards the corner of a ceiling and finds himself in corner world. We don't really know what happens while he's there, but we do learn that police came to the house and found Riley in the corner sleeping, but after further inspection, all of his organs appeared to have been folded along various axes, reminding me of his earlier theory about the corners being used in a way to keep the baby corner folk in place. The next episode, Liberty Lurker, has us listening to an audio excerpt from 1889 of an interview with the designer for the Statue of Liberty. He goes on to basically talk about how frustrating it was to work with the US, every month getting changes requested, mostly about the size of the pedestal she was to stand on. In 1949, major renovations were performed on the statue, however the blueprints were classified for 36 years. We get to go through these blueprints, and I'm no engineer, so the only thing that stood out as potentially strange were the wheels underneath the lady, but maybe I'm just not very observant. We continue on to hear further audio recordings from a guest who visited the island in 1954, and reported that the experience was terrible. Multiple other sources claimed the island had an awful odor around. The audio further describes how people were seen being led to the statue by officials in the middle of the night. Officials would leave, but the people would not, and by the next day the smell would be even worse. Is there something inside these statues eating these mass amounts of people? I'm not too sure yet. After more concerns were made, the Ellis Island Immigration Station got completely shut down. Then in 1985, something called a Liberty Lurker was first spotted, and we see what those wheels were for as the statue starts to move off the pedestal and something begins to climb out before we quickly cut to black. It states that the local authorities likened the waste storage compartment to a mass grave. Next up, we have Rushmore Revenge. In August of 2003, the National Park Service found the National Monument vandalized, except looking closer at what was being said raises a few eyebrows. The US government can fund mass murder if it's labeled a national monument, and 2,600 American landmarks. That's a lot of murder. To the right of the photo, we see faintly, the blood of liberty will be avenged, and above it says, the souls of Lincoln will be freed. The original theory of something consuming all these people in that statue pedestal is sounding a bit more and more plausible. A few days later, even more messages are seen scribbled on the side, except this one is a bit more threatening. I will introduce infection next week, Monday through Sunday. Watch the symptoms. Due to obvious concerns, they send patrols out during the dates and times specified. The only suspicious looking thing would be a flashing light scene between two of the heads, and then the end when it looks like the monument grew spikes from the heads. 
We also learn that they put baby powder on the heads, which don't ask me. This next episode gets a bit wild and hard to wrap my brain around, Alcatraz Attack. We begin on a map of the military prison and nothing really looks that off except near the end where we see ruins and then the screen cuts out. When we first opened up it said this was before therapy and now we are on radiation therapy so I'm guessing these are tests being run somewhere within the prison. What I didn't expect was that the entire mass of Alcatraz was projected to move itself as if it's a living thing. We see that it is also replicating itself as we see along the horizon many, many Alcatraz prisons. So current working theories are that these monuments all have something inside them that the US has to feed people to. That's at least been the case with the Statue of Liberty and the vandalized messages on Rushmore seem to favor it as. Also, what's a better source of constant people than a prison, especially this one? Well folks, that theory does stand in question after this next episode. Dean Democracy. On ABC News, the anchor mentions that next week viewers should tune in to a nationally significant broadcast, and this broadcast gets hammered into people's brains every day up until that point, the viewer constantly being reminded to check into the broadcast. Over 60 million people tuned into this broadcast. What could be so significant? What are we waiting for? Let's bring them back home! Well, it's a quick announcement that James Dean was running for president. You would have thought world peace was achieved with the type of reaction this sparked. It took over all of ABC. They were literally just playing reruns of the short ad. His placement in the polls were through the ceiling, and every time the lady speaks more, the more suspicious I get. This man hasn't done anything, and has barely showed his face, yet he's getting a ridiculous amount of attention. His strengths were evidently in his advertisements. It even got recommended as a TV show and then quickly became the highest rated one. Dean also invited Nixon to race cars instead of debating, and after one day of hanging out, Nixon supposedly said that he himself would vote for Dean as he would be a better president than he ever would. I'm starting to think there's some potential mind control involved here because everyone seems to turn on a dime at the sound of this Dean for president. One interesting thing gets quickly mentioned that caught my attention. Dean proceeded to introduce many groups to the microphone, including civil rights activists and Native American families. Martin Luther King Jr. would also come forward to speak in his first appearance since an attempt on his life nine months prior. The Mandela effect isn't going to work that strong. I know something isn't adding up. This is the first time it seems that dimension hopping is getting reintroduced. At least that's what I'm being led to believe, given that King is still alive. Over the course of all his broadcasts, anti-Dean groups would continue to hijack them, however it only made him more popular. He was giving a speech where the audio cut off six seconds in and remained silent the entire time, and Stanley Kubert called it the greatest silent film of all time. Something definitely fishy is going on here. Next up, we have Air Force One Angel. On the same day Rushmore got vandalized, Air Force One made an unannounced trip across the US. People reported seeing it dropping off packages at these national monuments. A map shows drawing lines to each destination and it made me wonder if they were using the monuments as a way to connect corners all across the country. For what reason I am unsure. Probably has to do with dimension traveling. However, if it's the same day Rushmore got vandalized, maybe it has something to do with the infection it said that it would spread. The White House made sure to come out and say that the flight was unauthorized and unmanned. Next up, we got Lincoln Looker, and this one had me a bit confused. We listen in on three different interviews, the first one being from Maya Arnoldson. She goes on to explain a horrifying situation she found herself in, where she was put inside a metal suit with a mask over her face. It was terrifying. One moment you're at home answering the door, and the next you're stuck in some kind of suit. She states that straws would get put through the holes to feed her. However, it turns out that whoever these people were got the wrong person, so she was let out, and President Reagan was there profusely apologizing for the mishap as they had picked the wrong Lincoln looker. What is going on here, people? First up, what is a Lincoln looker? What is Reagan's involvement in this? We immediately come to find out in the second interview with Leonard Moreland that the president is able to choose one person to be a Lincoln looker, and it is so that the president can enact revenge on one person who wronged them. An alibi is created and the chosen person is abducted and, according to Maya, stuffed to a metal suit. He goes on to say that this has been tradition for a very long time. You might be surprised, but it's nothing new. It's been tradition. The public began to suspect that Lincoln lookers were being held in the portraits inside the White House, so to counter these rumors, all the paintings were taken down and reinstalled to show that there is nothing except a wall behind these paintings. 
The third interview is from a voicemail from Howard Melrose, who describes his visit to the Lincoln Memorial. He states that he started to hear a scratching sound coming from inside the statue, to which guards tell him it's just animals that get stuck inside. What? Apparently the scratching gets so bad that kids start to cry and even a blind girl goes up and starts banging against the statue. Howard also goes to bang on the statue after feeling compelled. The guards try to stop them at first, but the scratching becomes too much even for them. The marble began to crack and the head turned and faced Howard and the girl. He feared the head was falling, so he grabbed the girl and took off. He describes how he looks back and sees the head moving back into place and that something was inside, except it was no wild animal. The following episode, titled Washington Wormhole, begins with what sounds like a children's rhyme about the special tree. The forest fell swiftly as the lumberjack swung, except for the special tree, which could not be stung. She missed her friends and the hymns they sung, so she started a tune that broke the man's lung. Which, what makes it special, I'm not sure. The special tree was first photographed in the 1840s, and then about eight years later, construction on the Washington Monument began around the tree for some reason. In the 1860s, construction had to stop due to the Civil War. However, many war prisoners are seen being led into the monument. We know where this is going. Construction finished in 1888, and in the time between 1910 and 1971, 20 visitors went missing there. In 1972, a classified film titled Washington Standard Operation was leaked to news agencies. It appears to give us a rundown as to how people are killed inside this thing. My guess is the person goes in and an elevator shaft takes them all the way to the top. Something produces sound waves, maybe the tree, but the elevator floor seems to open up leading the person to drop to the bottom and, well, die. In the year 2000, the monument also got vandalized with some familiar verbiage. The infection is nigh, the music of Washington will end. Infection is bring me back to Rushmore and the music of Washington has to refer to the special tree being on the inside somehow. Yet in 2003, we see footage of what looks like a second Washington monument that's upside down heading closer to the upright monument. Before lightning strikes in between and we cut the black. We then learn that all 19 missing residents are then found unconscious at the base of the monument. What about the last one? We originally were missing 20 people, so we don't have them all. Delaware Double has us hearing the story of two people fishing at the Delaware River before they find something strange under the ice. The two fishermen, one of whom named Michael Tillen, wait a minute, that name sounds familiar. Looks like we may have found potentially the father of Riley Tillen, who was our lead in the first episode introducing us to the whole corner world. Anyways, the two fishermen find a person under the ice, and after hours of digging, they are able to get him out. Michael notices an eye twitch and immediately brings the body home to attempt a thaw. The man regained consciousness to yell, which prompted them to take the body to the hospital. After many confused looks, Michael finally realized where he recognized the man's face from. And who would have thought? But they dug out George Washington himself. After all of this gets out, we hear President Dean's deeply insightful thoughts on the whole ordeal. During Saturday's morning press conference, President Dean shared his thoughts on the discovery in two words. I'm surprised. Jesus. Up next, we have the Rockefeller tree tragedy. During the construction of Rockefeller Center, some workers set up a Christmas tree, and in hopes that it would become tradition, Rockefeller set forth to Babylon to try and find next year's tree. From the looks of it, we are hopping back and forth between Rockefeller's perspective and that of a little girl named Virginia's perspective as we switch over to her story. She described how Rockefeller looked and looked for trees, yet he just couldn't find the one that was just right. Until he came upon the special tree we saw earlier. I don't know how this looks anything like a Christmas tree, but who am I to judge? They try everything they can to get this tree moved. They tried axing it down, but that doesn't work. They tried blowing it up, but that doesn't work. What does end up working, however, is digging the tree out from under it except that it took three years to do so. It even then took another year to get the tree even ready to display in the center. We switch back over to Rockefeller's perspective as he talks about a tragedy that happened directly involving the tree he brought over. What could this tragedy have been? Rockefeller explains that it was a workplace accident that he could never have prepared for. Back to Virginia's story. She talks about how the mayor didn't think the tree looked good enough and wanted to glue branches all around it, which I could only imagine would not look very good. However, Virginia had been saving up for over nine months to afford a tree ornament because she wanted to be the first one to decorate the tree. Yet to her dismay, she realized that the tree was way too tall for her to reach. 
She devised a, not very wise, plan to get to the top, and that involved calling up ten of her friends to form a human ladder that she would stand atop on. After she put the decoration, things would start to go awry. The tree curves itself backwards and all the glued branches come right off. Lightning starts to shoot all around out of the tree, causing the child ladder to collapse. The kids all try to run away, however as if the lightning had auto-targeting, it went right towards the kids and struck them all. Virginia describes being blinded by a bright light, and once her eyes adjusted, she found herself in a field full of the special trees. She isn't there for very long before the screen cuts to redacted, but the captions give us more of the story she was trying to tell. She says that a man tells her that the trees are not trees. My guess is that Special Tree Land is actually Corner World, as Virginia describes that there are also a lot of people there too. She ends up waking back up where they fell, yet the tree has disappeared. Virginia is also quick to point out that her surrounding area looks familiar, yet also vaguely different. Hello. Uh -oh. Rockefeller goes on to explain that he initially assumed that the children's story were an exaggeration until he took a look at their medical examinations. He then states that he would have preferred there to have been a death rather than presumably what had happened. Except if it's dimension hopping like I'm guessing, I, I don't know why he would say this. Back to Virginia, she talks about being visited by her parents, but she says they look different to her. Every question and answer given by the parents and Virginia just lead both parties to more confusion. The parents are confused as to what tree Virginia would be hanging a decoration on and where she got the clothes she had on. After more confusion, the parents leave the room in hysterics. None of the kids seem to have recognized the faces of their parents, two of which no longer shared last names with the parents. In what appears to be a test, this world's Rockefeller sits down with the kids and begins to ask them basic questions about American history. Rockefeller shook his head after each answer, and after Virginia told him who she thought she was, his demeanor changed and he got real quiet. That night, they took x-rays, but they wouldn't show the results. Virginia snuck by and overheard the nurses repeating one phrase over and over, everything's backwards. Parallel dimensions? Rockefeller describes that he was brought great concern because the children described his history as solely involving the oil industry and his philanthropy, but ignored his two terms as president, as if he never was. This just shows how vastly different history has changed between the two worlds. Parents had shared worries that their kids had been swapped with doppelgangers, some still searching for their real children. He goes on to share that he is regretful of even digging up the tree to begin with, explaining that perhaps each person has a predestined track and no matter what, he was always going to pick that tree, or the other way around, and the tree chose him. The next episode, called Canyon Crown, has us in a more modern period as we follow a Grand Canyon trip video. The person filming reports seeing something weird that started making the whole place smell of vinegar. He says that he sees it again, except this time it looks like a huge mass shifting over. The following text explains that our character's dad tells him that it was a canyon crown, and they use vinegar to shrink their heads back into their bodies. Yes, this all makes perfect sense, and I'm following along greatly. However, the kicker here is when the person says that the reason they went on this trip is so that his dad could find his sister named Maya Arnoldson, our Lincoln looker. Well, perhaps not the same lady that was interviewed, but the person she was initially mistaken for the person meant to be the looker. We have now reached the final episode of the first season, Freedom Fallers. We begin to follow Morse code excerpts of a conversation in 1858 between four individuals, two being from DC and the two others being from Italy, presumably during the talks of building the Statue of Freedom, which once we previously heard, the US is difficult to work with. We get some design change requests and a bit of delay until the detective tells our engineer that the sculptor has died and the freedom statue is being sent on a ship. We cut to the perspective of who I believe is the daughter of the sculptor as she describes seeing his sketches for a freedom statue and asks if he could ever make a statue that looks like her someday. However, the next time he goes into a studio is his last as he never returns. The mom comes home after checking the studio and immediately goes into the room. Once detectives visit her, all she yells is she has his eyes. Are the sculptor's eyes in the statue? The daughter remembers overhearing where the statue is being sent, and she jumps aboard the ship and gets into the crate that holds the Freedom statue in hopes of being sent to her father. She says she feels his spirit around Freedom. Periodically, the daughter talks about how she feels as if the statue is alive, and that she believes to hear her dad walking around outside. She jumps out of the crate to see, but it isn't her dad. But something with his eyes. Presumably the Freedom statue, I'm guessing. The daughter begins to grow more afraid of going inside the box due to the noises she is hearing. However, it is the only place to hide from the other people on the boat. Not too long after, the thing with her father's eyes is said to have taken her off the boat, 
into a jungle and up a mountain, slashing down every tree with its sword. They both end up in a hole within a deep cave before the presumed statue tries to start a fire. The daughter says that ever since she started riding, it has been staring at her. We then cut to the perspective of the captain of the ship carrying the statue. The captain states that after checking on the crates, they found several holes in the storage room allowing water to start leaking in, and that when they got to customs officials, the crates with the statue parts were all empty. After this, we hear from the perspective of the commissioner, who heard reports of a large force moving up the mountainside. It looked as if a deep linear trail was etched into the side up the top. Looks like our sword slashing statue was truly a force. Officials make their way up the mountain and into the discovered cave. Inside, they see the statue and a flattened human corpse laying next to it. Oof. We also learn that someone's hollow torso had been stretched a quarter of the way up the statue. Whether that's the little girl's or someone else's, I'm not sure. Following this, we go to the perspective of a craftsman who is at the arrival of where the Freedom statue was supposed to end up. However, instead of finding a statue on the ship, they find an actual lady. Did the statue turn into a lady? The craftsman overhears a conversation where the captain says that they had a huge fight with the statue at the initial stop where they found the crates empty. It later gets revealed that underneath the skin of the lady is the statue they need, so they hire our guy up to peel all that skin off so they can get their statue. The craftsman explain that for now she is dormant, but she will awaken again. After this, we follow a raid on the Capitol building by the anti-Dean Association we heard about earlier. During the Capitol storming, the statue was shot down. After the statue falls, we cut to the inside of the building, where, I'm gonna be honest, I had no clue what I was initially looking at. But we see the Statue of Freedom is peeking her head down under the doorway before raising back up, to which we then start to hear a woman screaming, and I don't know about you, but it sounds like some stretching is going on in the back. Maybe the statue is climbing inside people, however we won't find out yet because that's how season 1 ends. I truly found this one to be the most interesting considering its ever developing plotline. It introduces dimension traveling in the beginning and then it hits you with it again a couple episodes deep where it wasn't mentioned for a while, so that once weird stuff starts happening again you can go, oh well we know that alternate dimensions are a thing and it leads to cool theories you can form. When it came to each series, I was able to quickly become very engrossed in each episode and the journey following along was truly a sight to behold. I enjoyed how The Walton Files kept its story very hidden in the background and made it to where it felt like a true mystery being uncovered alongside our characters. Vita Carnus was an introduction into a fascinating world similar to our own, except the existence with these freaky meat creatures that appear to be tricking us into believing they aren't so harmful, or they're just being worshipped by a crazy cult trying to control people with quote unquote flavor enhancer. And my personal favorite of the three, Monument Mythos, telling a dark twisted tale on American history. Whereas of right now, two alternate timelines are existing that we are hopping between, and there's a connection with seemingly large creatures inside of monuments feeding on people. At least those are all my current theories, as some of these have more episodes I need to catch up on, especially Monument Mythos, considering I'm two seasons behind. I will definitely be exploring more analog horror, potentially following up on the new releases of all the series I have covered so far. However, it probably won't be the next upload because if I strictly talk about analog horror, I will probably quickly start to form a distaste just due to how much I am watching and talking about them. So consider this analog horror series a nice little trilogy of me diving deep into the incredibly disturbing world of analog horror. If you guys want me to cover updates on these series, maybe I'll make more individual videos instead of clumping multiple different series into one video. But if you are still here after this probably extremely long video, then I definitely ask that you hit the subscribe and like button and be sure to tune in to whatever comes out next.